pleased to have Malala Kamaluddin, Chair of the Department of Quranic Exegesis uh, at Donald Pasman College to speak today of Tafsir. Welcome, Malala. Thank you for having me, Usher. Um, so this episode is part of a series on navigating resources in Islamic studies with experts who know their stuff. Uh, you can find other episodes in this series, uh, such as an Introduction to Islamic Archaeology, Navigating Digital Resources, Anatomy of Hadith Works, and more on the YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, Laura, thank you so very much for being here and being a part of this series. Uh, I'm confident that listeners will benefit from you uh, the way, the same way that everybody in uh, the greatest city, Chicago, has benefited from you. Um, and so uh, uh, before we start, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, thank you again for having me on. Um, and uh, I look forward to this presentation with you. Um, so a little bit, uh, currently I'm at Dar al-Qasim College, recently became a college, alhamdulillah, and um, I am a, I'm the chair of the Department of Quranic Exegesis, the Department of Tafsir, um, and also uh, a librarian here at the Moana Anwasha Kashmiri Library. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, the Milana has prepared a presentation for us, and so I will stop talking and uh, hand the floor over to Milana. Thank you. So Bismillah, Alhamdulillah. Uh, this this uh, presentation um, and conversation with Usher uh, revolves around the topic of Tafsir al lughawi and some of the main primary and secondary sources uh, on the process of how to derive the Sir Lughawi and substantiate and corroborate um, those different types of explanations and exegesis. Um, the first slide here is essentially Whenever you're talking about a term, uh, especially a compound term such as this one, uh, you want to be able to understand the terms separately and together as well. So uh, what is tafsir? Um, there are many definitions uh, that are given in regards to tafsir. And I wanted to highlight uh, a few of these definitions, uh, a portion, not the entire definition, but a portion of these definitions. Um, so the first one here is by Abu Hayyan. Abu Hayyan has a exegesis uh, uh, called Al-Bahr al-Muhit, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later on. And in this, um, this is uh, what we call nowadays uh, a work of i'rab al-Qur'an or grammatical exegesis of the Qur'an. Uh, but uh, the, the work is titled Al-Bahr al-Muhit, The Vast Ocean. Um, and it is a vast ocean when it comes to uh, the linguistic and lexical underpinnings of the Qur'an uh, that are discussed by Abu Hayyan. So in his introduction, um, he defines tafsir, and uh, he says tafsir wa ilmun yubhathu fihi an, and he has you know different uh, different um, parts of the definition that are given there. That tafsir is a science that researches that discusses the following things, and amongst them, ahkamu al fadl Quran al ifradiya wa tarkibiya wa maani halati. Amongst the science of tafsir, the what it, the science uh, discusses uh, words of the Quran ifradiya in isolation. So, what does this word mean in isolation? What tarkibiya, and what does uh, the the word mean in combination in terms of the context that it is in, the what it is joined with. And the meanings that it carries in that combination. Right. So 
that definition is by Abu Hayyan. So he he he's highlighting here that the words of the Quran, uh, part of the seed is understanding the words in isolation prior to them being uh, understood in the Quran, as well as uh, in combination with what it is, what is before it and after it. Another definition by Al-Kafiji. Al-Kafiji, uh, he wrote a work uh, called At-Taysir Fi Qawaid Al-Tafsir. Ease in understanding the rules of tafsir is a rough translation of its title. And, you know, he he's actually, um, this nispa that he became famous for, Al-Kafiji, is actually um, a book on Nahu called Kafiya. And then in in uh, where he was from, the the attribution, the nisba, uh, is with a jim ya yeah, when it's uh, muarab Arabicized. So he he's his name uh, comes from him studying the work Gafiji for so long that he's attributed to that work. And so uh, he 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 defines um, at the in his book at Taysir fi Qawaid al Tafsir. He also defines what Tafsir is, and he says. It is unveiling the meanings of the Quran. And then he has other portions of this definition. And then he says, whether it be linguistic meanings of the Quran or other more technical or legal meanings of the Quran. And it includes words that are what what the meanings are in terms of what in terms of designation um, the science of what is a science that was developed along along um, along the back of the science of uh, uh, and the also understanding uh, it in terms of placement and context and then the third definition I have here is by Ibn Ashur, the famous uh, recent uh, or contemporary, uh, you know, Tunisian scholar who wrote uh, at Tahrir wa Tanweer. Um, and he, he states, at tafsir is ismun lil ilm al bahisi an bayani ma'an al Quran wa ma yustafadu minha. Tafsir is the name of the science that researches the uh, uh, the explanation of meanings of the Quran and what is derived from it. And so I, I use, there are other, uh, you know, definitions of tafsir that one can take from ulum al-Quran works or other muqaddimas of tafsir works. Uh, however, I chose these three because of the concentration on the tafsir al lughawi And so lugha is a is a translated into Arabic as um, into English as a language, and <clears throat> you know when we when we say lugha, uh, what does lugha mean? Lugha. This is this is the question that is not often asked, uh, and so since we are discussing the siru uh, we we have to address this question. What does lugha mean? Lugha. And so Loha is, uh, it has uh, different meanings. Uh, one, Ibn al-A'rabi mentions the meaning of mail, that lexically, the word Loha means to incline towards something. So when you say, they spoke a word, they, uh, they, they said something, they inclined towards it. And then Ibn Faris in his Mu'ajim Muqayis Lugha, which we'll discuss a little bit later, he defines Lugha as Lugha bil amr idha lahi jabihi. Another underpinning shade of the word Lugha, lexically speaking, is that when a person is devoted to something, dedicated to something, uh, when they say um, in Arabic, lahi jal fasil ummah, that when a nursing baby Lahija um, umma uh, wants its mother that that uh, it wants to nurse. 
they use the word lahija in that regard. So the word loha has these has this type of underpinning. And so based upon that, you know, what is the definition of a tafsirul lughawi? So there is a book uh, that is that devotes to this uh, um, topic in great detail. This by a contemporary um, uh, Saudi scholar, uh, Musaid Tayyar. Uh, he he def he combines these and he defines a uh, tafsirul lughawi as bayanu ma'an al Quran bima warada fi lughat al Arab, explaining the meanings of the Quran. And that portion is general, right? explaining the meaning of the Quran. You can do that in many ways. You can explain the meanings of the Quran through other ayat in the Quran. You can explain it through hadith, tafsir bil ma'thur. You can explain it, explain it through asbab al nuzul. Uh, you can explain it through even you know uh, contemporary understandings uh, of the different uh, sciences that have been developed um, over time, but. Tafsir al-Lughawi is explaining the meanings of the Qur'an bima warada fi lughat al-Arab. This second portion is restrictive. That this type of explanation or exegesis is restricted to that which can be found in the Arabic lexicon. Right? That which is transmitted from the Arab authoritatively. So that's, the, that's what we are going to be focusing on in, in this lecture. Why is this important? Why is Tafsir Lughawi important? Um, there is a famous statement that is attributed uh, to the Fuqaha, um, and they say that uh, is very famously attributed to Imam Shafi'i. Rahimahullah. He states, Kalam al Arab la yuhitu bihi illa nabi. That the Arabic uh, corpus, the Arabic language, the Arabic lexicon, cannot be encompassed except by a Nabi. Uh, and so the uh, understanding the Quran as it was understood to those who it was revealed to, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sahaba, uh, is important. Um, and so this idea of um, understanding uh, the Quran in its Arabic underpinnings is mentioned in the Quran itself. So in Surah Ibrahim, ayah number four, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ That when a prophet was sent, they would only be sent speaking the language of its people, the language of their people, لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ So that they could explain, bayan, right? And throughout the Quran, there are a few ayat that discuss how the, the, the you know, discuss the Sir Lughawi uh, and why the Arabic lexicon is important in understanding the Quran. This ayah in Surah Yusuf, Inna anzalnahu Quranan Arabiya. That revealed it as an Arabic Quran, so that perhaps you may comprehend it. Comprehension uh, of the Quran uh, cannot be divorced from the Arabic underpinnings uh, that it that it that it comes from. Uh, and then this uh, ayah in Surah Taha as well. وَكَذَلِكْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ قُرْآنًا عَرَبِيًّا this also um, discusses uh, these things. The, uh, uh, on the bottom of the page, on the slide here, I wanted to mention a few statements of um, uh, influential uh, scholars uh, that speak about how you cannot divorce the Arabic from the Quran in terms of understanding the Quran. And so Ibn Faris in his, uh, in another book called As-Sahibi Fi Fiqh al he mentions, إِنَّ الْعِلْمَ بِلُغَةِ الْعَرَبِ وَاجِبٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُتَعَلِّقٍ 
من العلم بالقرآن والسنة والفتية بسبب حتى لا غناء بأحد منهم عنه وذلك أن القرآن نازل بلغة العرب ورسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عربي So he says here that knowledge of the language of the Arab is necessary for anyone who is uh, attributing themselves to the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah and to fatwa. Um, and no one can, uh, no one can be, uh, everyone is dependent upon, uh, upon the Arabicness of the Quran because the Quran was revealed بلغت العرب and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Arabi. And then Imam Shatibi, he states in his muwafaqat لا بد في فهم الشريعة من اتباع معهود الأميين He phrases it this way. He says, it is necessary to, uh, in, or, uh, in order for it to be necessary to understand Sharia. One must follow the norm and custom of the Ummiyin, the unlettered ones. They are the Arabs whom the Quran was revealed in their language. And so to understand the ma'ani, the alfaz, the asalib of the Quran, the meanings, the utterances, the different forms and methods of speaking, uh, one has to be acclimated uh, and proficient in Lughatul Arab. Um, and, you know, there are examples of this in people making mistakes in interpretation of the Quran um, because of their lack of knowledge of the Arabic language. Um, some, you know, some, there are many contemporary examples that one can resort to, but I'll, I'll provide a classical one. Uh, um, once um, Abu Aliya, uh, who was a student of Hassan Basri, um, someone asked in surah, in regards to um, Surah Al-Masad, uh, uh, Surah Al-Ma'un, um, they asked, uh, uh, that what does it mean those who are negligent عن صلاتهم. so Abu Aliya he stated that it's referring to the person who who uh, forgets which raka'ah he is in in salah right is he has two raka'ahs passed or three raka'ahs passed uh which which unit of prayer is he in? And Hassan al Basri said, Mah, ya Abul Aliya. No, that's not the correct interpretation uh, here. Um, an, it, it, this is referring to someone who is negligent of salah in totality, meaning they don't pray salah on time. That's what this ayah is referring to. Him. And, and uh, but to understand, the misinter misinterpretation of Abu Aliya, one has to understand uh, Lughatul Arab and what does the word an mean? Because the word an can refer to uh, uh, time or place. It can, it, it, it has the meaning of zarfiya, meaning an can be in the meaning of fi. That's what Abu Aliya interpreted this ayah as, Allavina. He interpreted an as fi, um, because there are in language you can uh, this harf this preposition an does come in the meaning of fi sometimes. Uh, for example, when a person says, um, right? I will not, I will not, uh, I will not delay in protecting uh, my homeland. You know, so uh, there are examples of this, that, you know, that understanding uh, the uh, Arabic lexicon and the usages uh, of the language in order to come to the right conclusion of 
what the ayah is stating. So with that, let's move on to uh, methodologies of tafsir lughawi that you will find in books of tafsir. Essentially, you're not, every book of tafsir uh, is going to have some level of tafsir lughawi, right? And uh, I'm gonna concentrate on the, on the second portion here in this session. However, this is found throughout. So sometimes um, the mufassirun, the uh, scholars of tafsir, they'll state the lexical tafsir without tracing its origin back to authoritative Arabic poetry or prose. So um, essentially they'll mention the tafsir lughawi without mentioning the dalil, the proof for it. Um, for example, uh, Tabari, he mentions in, in, uh, in this ayah, in Surah Al-Takwir, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ Someone asked him about, someone asked Umar radiallahu an about this ayah. And Umar radiallahu an stated, يُقْرِنُ بَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ مَعَ الصَّالِحِ فِي الْجَنَّةِ that this uh, when souls are joined together, what does what does zubijat mean? Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, does give a tafsir lughawi of the word um, zubijat by using the word yukrin, right? He uses the word yukrin to explain what tazwij means, that this word. Uh, it has the meaning of combining one thing with another. That's why, uh, you know, marriage is called, uh, the spouse is called zoj or zoja. So, um, so he says that a, a pious person will be joined with a pious person in, in Jannah, whereas the evil people will be joined with others that are like them in the fire. So here, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an and Tabari quoting him is giving a tafsir lughawi, but we're not tracing back the word to uh, its, uh, to its uh, where, how it's used um, in Arabic poetry or author authoritative prose. So um, that's that. That's one example. Another example uh, in Tafsir book uh, is um, uh, in the meaning of وَكَأْسًا dihaqa. So here the word dihaqa uh, is mentioned as um, so this Tafsir is, is mentioned by uh, also by uh, Mujahid and others um, that uh, the word dihaqa it means mal'a, right? And so Ibn Abbas anhuma, is interpreting the word, uh, the cups filled, right? The word dihaqa as mal'a, but he's not tracing that meaning back to um, poetry or prose, shair or nathr. But one can if they wanted to. So many books of tafsir will state the tafsir lughawi, the lexical exegesis of a word or words, but they won't trace it back to its origin. But the second one, right, so you will find this in, in, in many works. So you will find this in Tabari, so you, you will even find it in tafsir bil ma'thur, tafsir lughawi, in tafsir bil ma'thur, like Tabari, Tabari's work, uh, Suyuti's Durul Manthur, um, and other works of Arab al-Qur'an. So I, I talked briefly about Abu Hayyan's al-Bahr al-Muhit. His, his student also has a book says, similar to that called Adur al-Masun uh, by Samin al-Halabi. Um, and so these are more classical works that are put in the genre of Arab al-Qur'an, uh, but even contemporary works like uh, Muhyiddin al-Darwishi's Arab al-Qur'an, um, which is very common. Uh, commonly uh, studied and and uh, re referenced because of its um, you know structure. It it uh, it's a contemporary structure 
uh, that uh, is a good initial reference for uh, Robin for that. Thanks, Laura. Uh, do you mind kind of just translating some of these Arabic terms that you mentioned, like Arab and stuff like this? Sure, sure. So, um, contemporarily speaking, there is a, a genre of tafsir called Arab al Quran, in which they um, they grammatically parse ayat. Uh, so it's a grammatical exegesis of the Quran, um, and uh, so they will break down the ayah, parse it in terms of what it is grammatically. Uh, and then from there, they may, uh, those, those books also contain a lot of um, lexical discussions, rhetorical discussions, tafsir balaghi is, uh, you know, rhetoric. Um, and then tafsir bil ma'thur is referring to the genre of tafsir uh, that is, uh, in which there is a lot of transmission. So not uh, oftentimes there's the classical dichotomy of tafsir bil ra'i with tafsir bil ma'thur, which is you know maybe a good starting point, but there's uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of branches and um, overlap between between the two um, between the two uh, uh, you know the, the types of tafsir. So tafsir bil ma'thur. Bil Ma'thur comes from the word Athar, which, uh, which is uh, referring to tafsir by transmission. So it's re usually referring to tafsir um, that is transmitted from the Prophet وسلم, or from the Sahaba or Tabi'een. Uh, uh, the transmission of what they have stated regarding this tafsir. So the famous uh, examples of tafsir bil Ma'thur are, you know, Tabari's uh, tafsir. Uh, Jamia al Bayan and uh, Suyuti's Adur al Mansur. Um, oftentimes, people put Tafsir bin Kafir within that category as well. as um, So, these are examples of that. So, uh, Usher, can you mind if I go forward now? Uh, yes, please. Shukran. Now, the second type of Tafsir is. Uh, stating uh, the methodology of tafsir lughwi that is found in tafsir books is stating the lexical tafsir while also tracing its origin back to sha'r or nathr authoritative authoritative arabic poetry or prose an example of this is uh, suyuti rahimullah uh, quoting a line of poetry uh, regarding the ayah hal fi dhalika qasamul lidi hijr so in in this uh, in this ayah, um, uh, the uh, um, the word the hijr. What does the word hijr uh, mean? And so here, um, Suyuti quotes uh, a line of poetry. He says, "وَكَيْفَ رَجَاءِ أَن تَثُوبَ وَإِنَّمَا يُرَجَّى مِنَ الْفِتْيَانِ." So, how do you understand the word the hijr? He says, okay, the hijr means aql, right? And then he says, how do we justify that? This line of poetry also uh, states that it means uh, hijr. Uh, the, it's also used the word hijr in the meaning of aql. So, the line of poetry translates as how can I hope that you will become conscious? Uh, hope of that is only from young men who possess intellect. So you can see that the, the Quranic word, the Hijr, is being traced back to poetry. And this poetry can be uh, of different eras. Um, uh, sometimes it's Jahidi poetry, pre-Islamic poetry. Sometimes it is poetry of uh, other individuals, uh, either during the time of the Prophet or afterwards, as long as they can, they are considered an authority in the language. Um, and also, uh, you can then substantiate um, these lines of poetry.
you can uh, so <clears throat> um, you can you can then substantiate these lines of poetry by looking at works like Ibn Faris's Maqayis al lugha So Ibn Faris in his Maqayis al lugha uh, he he says, okay, you have the word hijr that is not usually compared with aql, not usually interpreted as as a, uh, as intellect. Now, why? Why does this word mean intellect? And so he says. Uh, so the word hijr, also the word hujra uh, means room because it has boundaries. A room has boundaries, right? And so the word hijr, um, why is it called, why is intellect called hijr? Because borders, parameters, stop you from doing things that you shouldn't do, right? That's why the aql is called Hijr. That's why intellect is called hijr. Uh, uh, and the word aql can be inter looked at in a similar way. It has a restrictive sense. Um, the, uh, you know, the word iqal. Iqal refers to when you uh, hamstring an animal so that it can't move and get up. So uh, that, that all uh, plays into understanding the word the ayah al hijr. So there is an example of Suyuti uh, tracing back the um, the lexical tafsir of a word to poetry, and you can do this with prose as well. Right? Essentially, prose is the written or spoken language without uh, it being in meters. Right? So the meter structure that we have in poetry, um, uh, if it is not, if we call that shi'r, and then if it's not in that meter structure, then it's called nathr. And there are, um, in, in tafsir books, you can also attribute it to nathr of an Arabic dialect or tribe. And an example of that here is وَيَمْنَعُونَ uh, الْمَاعُونَ In Surah Al-Ma'oon, once again, Min Shihab Al-Zuhri, uh, he states that Al-Ma'oon bi lisani Quraysh Al-Ma'al That Ma'oon has different meanings. So if you look up the word Ma'oon um, in different dialects, it has different meanings. But bi lisani Quraysh, in the dialect of the Quraysh, it has the meaning of wealth, Ma'al. And then, so he's attributing it to, um, uh, you know, um, and then he he follows that up with other um, usages. Uh, another example of this is uh, um, uh, I don't I didn't list it here, but in in Surah to Safat, there's an example of Atadaruna Baalun wa Tadaruna Ahsan al Khadiqin in Surah to Safat. Uh, the story of Abdullah ibn Abbas, عنه, he, he heard two men arguing uh, over a camel, that who owns this camel. And they said, the, and one of them said, Ana And so uh, from there, Ibn Abbas, you know, knew of this ayah in the Quran, and he, and he understood that the word Ba'al means Malik, Rab, owner. And so uh, this ayah in Surah Al-Safat, atada'una ba'lan, the word ba'lan sometimes is attributed to a particular idol. Do you call ba'l? But do you call uh, other deities, other lords? وَتَذَرُونَ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ And abandon uh, the greatest creator. So uh, again, um, the in this example, um, the it's traced back to spoken language right and then here you have a uh, another example uh so the hack states the word ma'avir means sutur drapes or coverings and ahlul yemen uh used to call their uh, coverings sitter 
المعذار which is the singular form of معاذير so essentially in tafsir books where you see ما ورد في لسان العرب uh, that's where uh, you you see examples of tafsir lughawi being attributed uh, to an example of Arabic prose, and more specifically to um, a, a specific tribe or dialect, such as in these two examples, Bilisani Quraysh or Ahlul Yemen. Now, there are two uh, sub-genres of Tafsir Lughawi that I want to concentrate on today. Um, one of them is Gharib al-Qur'an, and the other is al-wujuh uh, and And so uh, Gharib al-Qur'an, the word Gharib in Arabic refers to something that is obscure. Al-Ghamid min al-Kalam. It's something that is uh, obscure, strange. The word Gharaba means ba'uda, to be distant in terms of understanding. Essentially, you can consider Gharib al Quran a subgenre of Ma'an al Quran. Ma'an al Quran uh, was a genre of tafsir um, that is essentially a linguistic collaboration with the science of tafsir. And so, uh, the more the more famous earlier works on Ma'an al Quran are by Al Farra, Al Akhfash, Al Zajjaj. These are all examples of, uh, of a linguist explaining the lexical uh, uh, underpinnings of the words of the Quran in very brief form as it was done. Most of the earlier tafsirs are, in, uh, are not um, verbose. They're very uh, abridged and brief in their explanations. Um, and so, uh, the Gharib uh, al-Qur'an genre, um, uh, we'll talk, uh, we'll see examples of this um, uh, coming up, uh, take words that are you know, difficult for, uh, for the Am, the, the layperson, who is still familiar with the Arabic language and uh, explains, explains it. So it's kind of it depends. Uh, we'll see different types of works of Gharib al Quran. Some of them are like dictionaries of the Quran. Um, some of them are a bit different. Uh, we'll see examples of that coming up. But essentially, Ma'an al Quran um, is uh, is more broad. It it discuss it has discuss uh, discusses um, uh, uh, content related to Nahu uh, Sarf Arabic grammar, Arabic morphology, uh, Arabic et etymology, ishtiqaq. Um, and so uh, it also, um, the Gharib al-Quran can also discuss things that are not necessarily Gharib al-Quran uh, because the earlier, as you, as you might know, the earlier generation of, of scholars, um, they did not need to be as specific or systematic in their um, in their works, um, uh, and so f you'll see examples of uh, Ibn Khutayba, for example, in this ayah, that they are innocent of what they say about uh, of what is said to, about them. Uh, they he says that uh, this is referring to Aisha radiallahu anha, the famous story of uh, the false lie attributed against her. So. Um, you'll also find some of these tangential discussions that are not necessarily Gharib al-Qur'an specific in Gharib al-Qur'an works. And then the other uh, work, al-wujuh wa nadair this, this requires a little bit of explanation. And so um, in, in uh, the word wujuh is plural of the word what, which oftentimes, uh, you know, refers to face or category. Uh, uh, and the word nadair is plural of the word nadir. Um, and uh, that has the connotation of being similar or akin to 
something else. And so the genre of works titled Al Wujuh wa Nadair, also called Al Ashbah wa Nadair, um, is not specific to the Fsir. It also, you also find this category um, of title, the works that are titled Al Ashbah wa Nadair or Al Wujuh wa Nadair in Lugha, as well as in Fiqh. Um, and so, uh, but what does it mean when it, when it, when it has to do with the seer and the Quran? The word wujuh refers to al ma'an al muqtadifa lil lawthat al Quraniya fi mawadi aha min al Quran. The the various meanings of one word in the Quran in different places. So you have one word in the Quran. And it has different meanings each time it's used. Um, in sometimes uh, uh, contemporary authors call this mustalahat uh, al-Quran, like uh, Dr. Allama Khalid Mahmoud Saab. He he called this in his book Asar um, al-Tanzil mustalahat al-Quran. And you you'll find different um, contemporary terms for this, but it, it's all referring to the same thing. And the word nazair. Uh, so nadair, plural of the word nadir, refers to the different Quranic occurrences of that one word that have the same meaning. So an example, this is best understood through an example. Let's look at the word husna. So the word husna comes in the Quran a few times. And um, in, in terms of its other, uh, you know, derivatives, uh, there are many occurrences of the word husna. Um, but the word al husna itself, in that specific derived form, it occur, it occurs uh, a few times. One of them is in Surah to Yunus, in which it states, "Lil ladina ahsanul husna wa ziyada." So. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا For those who excel is al-husna. For those who excel is al-husna. So what does husna mean here? So some mufassirun state that this husna refers to uh, jannah. And ziyada, the, the excess there, the extra there is in, ref, in reference to seeing the countenance of Allah Ta'ala. Uh, uh, so um, that's so here the meaning the, of the word husna is al wajhul awwad. The first wajh of al husna is jannah. Now, what is the nadir of this wajh? Nadir al wajhul awwad is an example of this is in Surah Najm. And he will recompense those who excel with husna. With husna, husna meaning jannah. So the waj is the meaning of jannah in Surah Yunus. The nadir is the same meaning. All right? In Surah Najm, you have the word husna and it has the same meaning of jannah. And I mentioned here Surah Rahman here as well because. Um, it's not not uh, the authors don't always use the same derived form. So in Surah Surah Al Rahman, Hal Jaza Al Ihsani Illa Al Ihsan. Right. This this ayah is referring to the word Ihsan, which is from the same root letters as Husna, but not the same form. Here, uh, Ihsan, also the second Ihsan. Uh, in Hal Jaza al Ihsani illa al Ihsan also refers to Jannah. That there is there any recompense for you know the people of Ihsan except Ihsan, meaning except Jannah. So that's another Nadir of uh, of Al uh, Wajhul Awwal, the first Waj. Al Wajhul Thani would be a second meaning of the word Husna. So this, a second meaning of the word husna can be found in Surah Al-Nahl, in which the discussion is of the mushrikun attributing 
banat, uh, daughters to Allah Ta'ala while claiming for themselves sons. Uh, so the word husna here doesn't mean jannah, but it, we, it means banun, right? Uh, uh, male offspring. So this is how we understand this genre of al wujuh wa nadair. Uh, this is one example. We'll see a few more examples and when we discuss specific books of al wujuh wa nadair. Do you have any questions on that, Usher, so far? No. Okay. Okay. So here, um, how to use uh, books of Gharib al-Qur'an. Uh, kind of get to the crux of, um, the, crux of the issue here. Um, in terms of we've defined how what is Gharib al-Qur'an and now let's go over some uh, some books and how to use them so the first one listed here is uh, by Raghib al-Asfahani Mufradat al-Qur'an right and this book let me share This book here, it, it discusses um, it discusses the work uh, of uh, Gharib al Quran and is the most popular uh, book in this genre and widely uh, discussed as the as the best. And so, uh, this edition that you see here. Uh, this uh, Darul Qalam edition is, in my opinion, the best edition of the work uh, because of um, the editor including uh, many beneficial uh, points in his marginalia and uh, tracing back uh, the works uh, the, to other, uh, other examples. Let me, uh, that was the muqaddimah, the introduction. Let's look at, have a look at the book itself. Um, so here, right? So just as an example, this, so this work is, is very easy to use because it is uh, discussed in alphabetical order. So any word that you want to look up, you look it up in alphabetical order and it gives you the, uh, the meaning of the word. Um, so for example, here, uh, فقع, uh, he, he discusses what the word means. He gives you uh, the Quranic usage of the word. Um, and he, he also quotes, uh, you know, linguists. So here he quotes um, Kitab al Ain of, um, of uh, Khalid ibn Ahmad al Farahidi. So this work is very easy to use. And it's usually the first reference in Gharib al-Qur'an, that when you want to understand the uh, linguistic lexical underpinnings of a Qur'anic word, you look it up here in Raghab al-Asfahani's Mufradat, and it's very easy to use. As you can see, there is substantiation of it through poetry, such as this example, um, Faqala, and then he mentions this line of poetry. Um, and he also quotes linguists, he quotes authoritative individuals. And uh, the Hashia here also does a good job in terms of adding to the discussion. And so uh, I usually would recommend uh, this particular uh, edition. The second work mentioned here is Gharib al Quran by Qasim al Qutlubha. So um, this, I couldn't really find a, um, a PDF of, but I have um, a, uh, um, a edition here, and there's an edition that you can see uh, listed 
uh, and the screen here. Um, so what Qasib ibn Qutlubqa, Hanafi um, scholar, what he did was he combined in one volume, two different tafsir, uh, Gharib al-Qur'an works. One by Abu Hayyan al-Andalusi, the scholar of al-Bahr al-Muhid that we discussed earlier, and, uh, which is uh, his Gharib al-Qur'an work is called Tuhfat uh, al-Arib, Bima fi al-Qur'an min al-Gharib. And, uh, and the other, um, and another book uh, on Gharib al-Qur'an called Al-Bayan fi Gharib al-Qur'an, by Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Farghani. Al -Farghani. So what he did was he essentially edited these two works. He added to them and um, he put them into one volume. And the first um, work um, uh, he is in the order of the Mus'haf. So you would if you were to look up an, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a word, you would have to look it up in according to the surah that it is in, right? So, uh, you know, you have to look up, if you're looking up a word in suratul, uh, surah to Yunus, surah to Nahl, uh, you have to look it up in that particular surah and then the ayah. Uh, and the second work is organized similar to Raghab al-Asfahani's work according to the uh, alpha, according to the alphabetical order, Huruf al hija So there are different uh, Gharib al-Qur'an works that, that organize the words in various ways. Um, these are the two primary ones, either in, in the in, in the order of how it's mentioned in the Mus'haf, uh, in the Quran, and or uh, in alphabetical order, uh, one of these two. The third uh, work that I listed here, At-Tahqiq Fi Karimat Al-Quran by Hassan Al-Mustafawi, Shi'i, uh, here, this work, it essentially um, takes what Gharib al-Qur'an literature produces and it amplifies it greatly. Um, and so uh, if you were to look at an entry in this work, uh, usually uh, this is a, you know, he also gives sometimes the Hebrew meaning uh, of the word um, and uh, but uh, if we were to look more at, you know, um, you know, a a, uh, a an Arabic uh, word such as the word asafa here, you know, and he he uh, he mentions um, a uh, an abbreviation meme qaf alif. So uh, these abbreviations are at the end of the volume. So uh, if you look at the very end here, right, these are rumuz lil kutub al manqula anha fil kitab. So uh, mim qaf alif is mu'ajim maqayis al lugha by Ibn Faris. So in, in, in his entries, uh, he will mention um, these abbreviations. And you basically have to trace it back to you. Know, once you start using the word work, um, often it becomes second nature. So misbah here is referring to uh, misbah, al-misbah uh, al-munir of Fayyumi, sin ha asad ha alif siha is referring to siha of siha lugha of Johari, and so on and so forth. Asa. Uh, is referring to Asas al balagha of Zamakhshari. And so the what what his primary contribution here is in, in the entry of tahqiq. So in each entry, you're going to look it up in alphabetical order. He gives you the meaning from these classical uh, uh, lexicons. And uh, you know, he he 
he uh, selectively chooses what to include here. And then he has a section called التحقيق, which is the title namesake of the book. تحقيق في كلمات القرآن الكريم. So he, here he combines the underpinnings of the word and he produces um, you know, a, a way to connect all of these underpinnings uh, in order to see the full linguistic breadth of the, of the word. And so that's the amplification of what you see in other books of uh, Gharib al-Quran. So uh, that contribution is something you will find here um, in this contemporary work of uh, Gharib al-Quran. And then uh, the, the fourth uh, Gharib al-Quran book that I have listed here is Fathul Khabir by uh, Shawiriullah Dehlawi. Um, so Fathul Khabir, um, you know, there, there are, I couldn't find a PDF of it, but you can see the, uh, the uh, you know, the edition here. Uh, the cont contemporary edition um, has a subtitle. So the, the title of the book is Fathul um, Khabir Bima la budda min hifzihi fi ilm al-tafsir. So Shahwari Allah uh, compiled this book uh, to be memorized. He compiled this book to be memorized. Um, and, you know, he, he essentially took what um, uh, Suyuti has mentioned uh, in Itqan, and he added to it uh, as it relates to the tafsir of, uh, attributed to Ibn Abbas. So in the, as a subtitle, you will see that it states, Jam'u tafsiri gharib ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, compilation of the tafsir of gharib words in the Quran by Ibn Abbas. And he primarily takes this um, from you know one other, so he takes what what is mentioned from Itqan and he adds to it, and he he mentions the he mentions that you know he primarily takes this from Kitab Tafsir in Hadith works, so in Hadith works uh, such as the Siha Sitta, uh, the six canonical uh, Hadith compilations, there are um, there is a chapter of tafsir in those hadith works. And so in uh, Bukhari Sahih, uh, Tirmizi, Sunan, and the Mustadrak of Hakim, these three particular uh, tafsirs, um, Shabudiullah combines what you find there uh, to, uh, to uh, you know, this, uh, this particular book. So uh, this is another example of, of Gharib al-Qur'an that is very selective. It's very selective. It's not necessarily based upon what the linguist, linguists have to say, but what has been transmitted uh, in the prophetic era uh, regarding that tafsir. And in this case, specifically from Abdullah ibn Abbas. The next uh, the next slide refers to how to read books of al-wujuh wa nadair So uh, we talked uh, on this slide what the word wujuh and nadair means. Um, and in there are you know two books that I kind of want to mention uh, on al-wujuh wa nadair um, the first one here by Muqatil ibn Sulaiman, um, an earlier work on this, on, this, uh, on this genre of tafsir, you'll notice that it is sometimes difficult to understand you know, the order here because, and the, the editor of this work also mentioned these, this problem. Um, there's another work by, um, by Yahya ibn Salam written not too, uh, about a few, 20, 30 years after um, Muqatil ibn Suleiman wrote this work. 
um, that's called uh, titled Tasarif, um, in which he follows a similar order. And the Muhaqqiq, the editor of that work, mentions that it's also, it's not a specific you know, order. It's not in the, it starts off, one can say, so the first entry in this book is Al-Huda. So Al-Huda, one might think, um, why, why is he starting with Al-Huda? And one could think, okay, in Surah Al-Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ So maybe he's going in the order of the Mus'haf. And you can say that maybe for a few entries, but then also that is not consistent. So, um, like I stated before, uh, many of these earlier works did not need to be so uh, specific in their in their uh, systematically presenting al wujuh wa nadair or gharib al Quran in this case al wujuh wa nadair. But uh, besides that, let's just look at um, an example of this and and uh, how we would then uh, look up words in this uh, in this genre of work. So uh, similar to what I mentioned before, Muqatil states that Huda has 17 waj, so 17 different meanings. Uh, and so uh, Huda means bayan, right? Uh, and then he gives you the nadir of it in these ayat, right? He gives you the nadir of it. So he mentions it in Surah Al-Baqarah, meaning the bayan meaning is there. It's in Surah Al-A'raf, it's in Taha. And then the second waj of Huda is Deen islam And then he gives you the nadir of it uh, here. The third waj is Iman. He gives you the nadir of it here. So that's how um, the work is utilized. But the index, the fihris of these works it will be a great aid. So uh, you have the, the fihris of the mawdu'at, the topics that are listed here. And you'll notice that you know, the editor did not reorganize the chapters in according to what would be easier for the uh, modern day researcher. Rather, you know, he left the order as is because you know, that's part of uh, academic integrity. <clears throat> So, because um, tahqiq is essentially to present the work as the author uh, would have intended to do so. And so since the author did write this work and he intended to write it this way, you know, if the tahqiq would be to present it and then what you own is, what is the editor's uh, milkiya, his possession is, you know, what is below the, uh, uh, the uh, line, meaning the marginalia, or um, you know the index, the introduction, he can add to that there. But nevertheless, you see here. So he starts with Huda, then Kufr, then Shirk, you know, and then he has these um, these. Uh, there seems to be like some level of systemization here in Talhud, Thulamat, Vadi Min, Vul, etc. And then he ends with uh, the word Falk, right? All of these. So it's not necessarily in a uh, particular order. But if you needed to look something up, this is where this index is beneficial. So he organizes it in accordance to the alphabet in this fihris. So if you needed to work up, look up akhira and you know, you're struggling to find it here, uh, you can look it up in this index, and it's on page 158, you know, and so on and so forth. So that's the benefit of the contemporary um, uh, fihris in al-wujuh wa nadair genre of work, both here in uh, this work of Muqatil ibn Suleiman, as well as uh, the work of uh, Yahya ibn Salam. Uh, which uh, I don't have, I think is here, yeah. So this is the work of Yahya ibn Salam, which is titled uh, Tasarif, 
تفسير القرآن مما اشتبهت أسماؤه وتصرفت معانيه. So this this title isn't actually uh, doesn't have al wujuh wa nadair in the title, uh, but um, it is it is uh, uh, categorized within that. Uh, a more an easier uh, work to look up this genre of of words is the work of Ibn al-Jawzi. Now, if you're familiar with Ibn al-Jawzi tafsir, Zad al-Masir, uh, you'll know uh, it'll be easy because he's very systematic in that tafsir as well. It's, uh, it is not a far stretch to understand the order in Nuzhatul A'yun al-Nawadir fi ilm al-wujuh wa al-Nadair by the same Ibn al-Jawzi. And so here in this work, he does organize it in accordance to the alphabetical order. So it's easier to look it up in this work. So that is that. Um, now, <clears throat> in terms of, in terms of uh, websites, and search engines that a person can use to look up words of Gharib al-Qur'an and, uh, and uh, al-wujuh wa nadair One of them is this website, uh, Al-Bahith al-Qur'ani. Uh, it also is called Tafsir app. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it has uh, different tafasir. Uh, here in this, um, in this that are easy to look up, but the one that I want to concentrate on first here is the ma'ajim section, so the dictionaries. So if we're looking up a word, like we start up, we type in sheen, qaf, right, and we we get these uh, derivatives either at the beginning of the word, sheen qaf in the fa'ain karima, as the first and second, because usually Arabic words have three root letters. And so the first two root letters are sheen qaf or the last two, such as in these examples of fa sheen qaf. So it's good in that regard. But if we were to look up, um, you know, the word shaqawa, uh, right? And you have these different dictionaries that you can look up into. Umdatul Hufalf is a similar, is a Gharib al Quran work by Samin al Hadabi, the author that we discussed, uh, who had written Adur al Nasun, uh, the student of Abu Hayyan al Andalusi. Um, uh, this, this work, Basail the Wit Tamiz, is very much like an encyclopedia of the Quran. And so it does contain. Um, if you look here, uh, it's by Fairuz Abadi, the same author as Qamus uh, al-Muhit, the famous dictionary. Uh, but here he mentions It's about three volumes. What, what this means here is it's actually six volumes. And um, volumes two, three, and four, if I recall correctly, two, three, and four, um, or three, four, and five. Well, those three volumes are particularly uh, for the Gharib al Quran, Wujuh, and Nawair um, entries. Um, so um, the first volume is uh, more uh, an introduction to each surah, the basira of each surah. Um, how, you know, how, what is the surah's topic, its themes, its ayat, its fadail, its virtues. Um, and then you have um, the last volume that is uh, more encyclopedic in terms of proper names and places. Uh, but the middle volumes are the ones that contain the genre of Gharib uh, al-Qur'an. And this work, Fihrusu uh, Judur al-Karimat, is also, uh, let's see, an example of this, is also a very uh, good initial reference for Gharib al-Qur'an because what it does is it shows you it's if you're familiar with uh, Fuad Abdul Baqi's 
معجم مقاي معجم مفتاح ترس في الفاظ القرآن is very similar uh, to this work in that it mentions that okay it says this root shaqawa is mentioned 12 times in the Quran and it it comes in the form of ashqa ashqa three times in the form of shaqi four times and uh, once in shiqwa and then four times uh, in the verbal form um, of uh, you know the three letter three root letter verbal form and then it lists them out for you here so it's very it's it's good in that regard um, <clears throat> but there are some drawbacks as well of uh, looking up words um, in in this sometimes you know for example uh, you want to look up uh, the the Yemeni king Tubba, who's mentioned in the Quran, and so it it, it can be, um, you know, it, it, you might have to, you know, go through, um, you know, uh, the the root letter Stabia, and then for example here, um, you have to go to the Alam section, the proper noun, and you'll see that you know Qawmu Tubba is how it's used and you'll find it there. So you do have to be familiar with, uh, you still have to familiar, familiarize yourself with how the Quran uses it um, and play around with different search um, qualifications uh, in order to find what you are looking for. But is this particular work, Fihru Sujudur Karimat al Quran, is very similar to Mu'atim Muqayis al Lugha by Fuad Abdul Baqi, uh, in which he, uh, you look up the word alphabetically, it mentions to you how many times it's used in the Quran and where it is used. As a starting point, it's a good initial reference. I had a question on this, on this website in general. Will it tell you the, um, Edition of, uh, of of the text and the page number in the edition that's used, or mm, that's a good question. So, for example, hey, let's let's look up a word, and uh, you know there are there are some some works that you can kind of uh, you can kind of uh, figure out uh, because there aren't that many uh, you know uh, editions of it uh, so it, it, like it, the clues are given here in so for example Ruhul Ma'ani is 28 volumes Masfati al Ghaib is 24 volumes uh, but some of these works have multiple editions and so it's not um, it's not clear which edition it is using, but there's a another website. I think it's called uh, atasir.org, uh, if I recall correctly. Or atasir.com. Mm, actually, this one doesn't do it either. I thought this one would have done it. Uh, but uh, I guess um, Shamila, Maktaba Shamila, uh, uh, has that option. Uh, uh, in which, if you're search let's 
it's not a button. What's that? So here in yeah, so here uh, it mentions the edition and it will mention the page number and the juz. So Zad al Masir, Muallif, Muhaqiq, Nashir, Taba'a, you know, so the publisher, date of publication, then you go to juz uh just one and then page so you have the jews here and the stuff here uh, just number page number so shamila will do it but uh, i don't if i i don't think al bahith al qurani or at the seer.com does it thank you you're welcome but they do seem to quote um you know the volume number which may indicate um, you know which volume they used but uh, when i mentioned for for uh the with the me because there's only one edition of it that they could have used um, that's why uh, i mentioned the comment about it being in six volumes but them utilizing um, about three or four volumes of it in this in this section of the website Okay. Now, uh, another section of the website which is beneficial for tafsir al lughawi is the i'rab al lugha section and the qira'at section. So here you'll see some of the uh, tafsirs that I, um, books that I had mentioned, such as Adul Masoon of Tafsir Halabi. Um, you have uh, i'rab al Quran or Bayan of Muhyiddin Darwish, and you have uh, other other uh, works here that one can reference. Um, the Tafsir of Abu Hayyan is actually in this Lugha or Balagha section, uh, Al-Bahr al-Muhid. And so uh, the, the classification here um, is, it's decent. It's, I wouldn't say it's, uh, it's uh, completely accurate, uh, but it is, it, it does help, right? Zad al-Masir is here which we were discussing of uh, Ibn al-Jawzi. And the other section of the Qira'at uh, section, which is also beneficial. And then you have the Gharib wa Ma'ani section uh, here. So the Ma'ani al-Qur'an, these, these were the ones that I was referring to, al-Farra, uh, Zajjaj. Uh, these, uh, this is a section that is also useful. Um, to conclude, there are some <clears throat> there are some other uh, discussions that we can also have in terms of how to substantiate and corroborate the Sir Lughawi. So, say you are looking up a word uh, in in a Ghayr Qadib al Quran work or a Wujuh wa Nadai work. And you want to know, okay, how do I prove or substantiate that this tafsir lughawi is accurate? So the primary references are other tafsir works that we discussed on those websites. Um, and, you know, other ma'an al-Qur'an, qarib al-Qur'an, wujuh al works. But other works uh, like ma'ajim al so Ibn Faris's Mu'jim Maqayis al Arabic lexicons like Lisan al-Arab uh, and Tajr al-Urus, these uh, lexicons, these dictionaries are also important to reference uh, in order to uh, substantiate and corroborate a tafsir lughawi. And then in terms of secondary literature uh, that one should be familiar with, uh, one of them is 
kutubu gharib al hadith so just as you have the genre of gharib al quran uh, you also have the genre of literature and gharib al hadith so oftentimes uh, those works will also discuss similar words um, as uh, that are mentioned in the Quran. And so they, they, they are a secondary reference point. Uh, works on ihtijaj uh, al-qira'at that discuss uh, specific, um, uh, you know, that prove uh, the qira'at based upon transmission. But also these works on ihtijaj al-qira'at uh, such as uh, Abu Ali al-Farisi's Al-Hujja lil qiraat al um they discuss they discuss points related to you know what is the linguistic lexical ben benefit of this qira'a difference, right? And so that also uh, is a secondary resource that a person can resort to uh, because. You know, the, the qira'at uh, oftentimes show you a different angle of the ayah. That's why uh, famous maxim, uh, that uh, a, a, another qira'a of an ayah is like another ayah itself. It shows you another angle. So one, one ayah may give you uh, the vantage point um, of the Quran from above, uh, and the, an another qira'a may give you the vantage point from within. Um, another qira'a may give you the vantage point from the front or from the rear. So it's كَأَنَّكَ تَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ بَيْتٍ وَاحِدٍ مِنْ جِهَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفَةٍ The other qira'at, they allow you to see one house from different angles. It's like looking at one house from different angles, from the aerial view, from the front view, from the interior. So the those works are also beneficial. Uh, and then, kutubu shuruhu dawawin al-shair. Just as there are commentaries on Quran and Hadith, there are also commentaries on uh, poems, like the Diwan of Khansa, Diwan of Ali, the Diwan of Imam Shafi, there, there are commentaries on these works. And um, if, you are, if you're familiar with uh, Muhyiddin Abdul Hamid and his tahqiq of, of uh, grammar works, such as Sharu Qatr al Nada, Sharu ibn Aqil, he has ta'liqat he has on these grammar works. What he does is essentially he explains the istishhad the witness of uh, a poet, uh, a, uh, the poem being a witness, uh, a proof for a grammatical point, he breaks it down. He explains the loha, he explains who said the line of poetry, who it was said to, what context it was said in. So these commentaries are also a great secondary resource to substantiate uh, different words. Um, uh, also, Kutub al Adab such as the works of Jahid al-Bayan with Tabiyin and other works um, related to Arabic literature, Al-Kamil um, Fil-Adab by Mubarrid, and other works. These are also uh, beneficial. They, and they show you uh, the linguistic uh, range the, by which a word was used. So uh, these are um, you know, ways to substantiate and corroborate the Sir Luqawi. And with that, you know, I'm kind of at a concluding my uh, presentation. Sure. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mulan, for this thorough introduction um, and guide to this genre of tafsir. Um, before we conclude, I wanted to ask if there is anything that you were working on that you wanted to tell us about any projects in the pipeline or anything like this. Oh, yeah. Jazakallah khairan for the question. Sure. Um, yeah, with the with the students here at Dar al-Qasim College, um, there are different projects that we work on, the SEER projects that uh, that we do um, in terms of producing 
critical reviews of the Seer editions. Um, I wrote one a few years ago on the Seer al Maturidi, um, the, uh, the Darul Mizan edition, and how it can be uh, considered a, a good, um, a good uh, edition by which to evaluate other tafsir uh, works. Um, we're also in the process of, you know, reviewing the other Nasafi, not Madarik, uh, but the other Nasafi, uh, Dar Lubab recently published uh, Taysir, uh, uh, tafsir, um, a few years ago, so reviewing that work. And we, uh, all this is in combination with like pr providing more access uh, to works of uh, review of works of from our um, Turas, our heritage, uh, as well as con contributing to the field uh, in terms of review, as well as tahqiq, uh, looking at uh, classical works and uh, editing them in a, in a way that would uh, add to the uh, to the tafsir genre as well as um, essentially provide a standard for how uh, tafsir works should be edited. Um, so that those are our uh, projects we've been working on here in uh, in the Department of uh, Quranic Exegesis, as well as uh, uh, we have launched the uh, the Khassus fit tafsir. Uh, program here at Darul Qasim College, uh, which is a uh, you know postgraduate uh, program in which students have the opportunity to specialize in tafsir. So uh, those are some of the projects we've been working on here. Excellent, thank you for that, and, and again, thank you so much for this. And with that, I'd like to conclude the episode.